Anti-Semitism is said to be on the rise in Europe and at its worst level in decades. Some countries are promising a crackdown, but are they doing enough and will new laws be sufficient? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hurad Belhamid. French President Emmanuel Macron says anti-Semitism is at its worst level since the Second World War. And this week, he introduced a bill that would make anti-Zionism a criminal offense. So what's the difference? Anti-Semitism, hostility and prejudice directed against Jewish people is already illegal in France. Anti-Zionism, opposition to the state of Israel, could soon be too. Now, elsewhere in Europe, 12 MPs resigned from their parties in the UK, nine Labour, three Conservatives, citing the failure to deal with anti-Semitism as one of the reasons. And the EU says hate speech and harassment are becoming the new norm. So is anti-Semitism a growing problem in Europe and are Jewish people being singled out? We'll discuss that with our guests shortly, but first, David Chater with more from Paris. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, was saying that uh, anti-Semitism has now reached its worst levels since the Second World War. Figures published uh, for last year show the number of anti-Semitic attacks had risen by 74%. Now, France has uh, the biggest Jewish community in Europe, of course, and he was speaking to community leaders at an annual dinner. He uh, promised uh, new legislation to ban hate speech on the internet. He also asked his interior minister to take action to ban extreme right-wing groups who were promoting and fueling violence and discrimination. But uh, perhaps the most significant thing is that he said that he would now consider taking action to make anti-Zionism part of anti-Semitism legislation. We don't know exactly what uh, form or shape that will take or when it will take place. But of course, the Zionist movement uh, was the political movement that established Israel, uh, Israel as the homeland for Jews in Palestine. Now, this is a very controversial measure. It's been proposed by some of the MPs in his own party before, uh, but uh, he turned his back on it. So this is a significant uh, development to include anti-Zionism in the legislation against anti-Semitism. The European Commission says a staggering 90% of Jews feel that anti-Semitism is getting worse, and four in 10 are thinking about leaving Europe. In France, there's been a 74% rise in offenses against Jews in the last year, while in Germany, a 60% increase in violent attacks. In Belgium and Poland, 92% of Jews experience anti-Semitism online, including social media. And in the Netherlands, 71% were abused on the streets and in public spaces. Okay, so now let's bring in our panel in London, Yossi Meckelberg. He is a professor in international relations at Regents University. In Poronin, Poland, via Skype, is Michal Bilevich, chair at the Center for Research on Prejudice at the University of Warsaw. And in Paris, Hugo Drochon, a political theorist at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hugo Drochon, let me start with you. I mean, President Emmanuel Macron saying that anti-Semitism is at its worst level since the Second World War is quite a bold statement. Does it reflect reality? It probably does to a degree. I mean, Macron has been saying these types of things for a while now. Already last year, during the commemorations of the Veldiv, which is where Jews were parked during Second World War before being sent off to the concentration camps, he was making these types of statements before. We saw that one of um, the recent polls suggesting that 74%, there was an increase in 74% in terms of anti-Semitic attacks. So I don't know if we're exactly in the same moment as World War II, but there has certainly been a marked increase in the last two to three years in anti-Semitism in France, for sure. Okay, and Yossi, is, when we talk about anti-Semitism in the 21st century, is it the same thing as uh, what, uh, is it similar to the one of the 20th century, or are there differences there? 
Uh, some of it has the same unfortunate trait and some of more modern and different in their character. You know, mentioning France, yes, you know, it went by 70 incidents, anti-Semitic incidents went up by, by more than 70 percent. There were 541 incidents in France. Some of them are the same sort of attacks on Jews, blaming Jews of controlling the media, controlling finance, having too much influence in war and conflicts in the world, basically controlling the world. And this is very similar, not only 20th century, but 19th century. Part of it is the type which is a mix, which is the anti-Zionist one. And I think it's very important to look at the definition of the International Holocaust Remember Alliance, which were this modern type of, of Zionism, eh, sorry, of anti-Semitism, which, which conflates between criticism and legitimate one of the government of Israel and the right of Jews to have self-determination. I think that's a very important distinction that we will discuss a bit further in, in the program, but I just wanted to bring in Michal, uh, because, I mean, France is not the only country that is facing this uh, wave of anti-Semitism. Uh, Do you think it is part of a wider umbrella of racism uh, that is on the rise throughout Europe, or this is specifically uh, targeted uh, just at the Jews of Europe? Uh, our research finds that anti-Semitism is very strongly correlated to other forms of prejudice, to uh, racism, xenophobia, and we really see that there were increases in uh, people's uh, distancing or, or negative attitudes towards Jews uh, just after the so-called migration crisis when actually Islamophobia and anti-Muslim attitudes went up in Europe. So we could really see that um, the more uh, uh, racist attitudes uh, dominate across Europe, the you know Jews become more uh, tar more often targets of scapegoating uh, as well. Well, it, it is very interesting because, as you said, uh, and I'm bringing this question to Hugo, there was this huge wave of anti-immigrants that brought all these populist uh, governments or leaders uh, to the forefront across Europe. But it's very difficult to understand how it went from anti-immigrants, which were mostly coming, uh, let's say, from uh, the Middle East or Africa. How did that ch translate into anti-Semitism? I think, yes, there, there's a question here. Every time there's uncertainty, and I think we're going through a period of uncertainty and instability, um, I think there was the shocks, if you want, of Brexit in the UK, Trump's elections, and the rise of the far right and populism in Europe. Any time there's uncertainty, kind of the old prejudices back, uh, come back in, kick back in. And we've seen in our, in our studies in terms of every time there's a bit of uncertainty, conspiracy theories rise massively. And of course, there's strong links, as has already been mentioned by some of the previous speakers, strong link between cons conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism, dating back into the 19th century. So it's part of a broader, broader mix. I think it's important to remember that anti-Semitism, it's not like it's gone anywhere, but it's the case that with certain developments, notably social media, technological developments, um, on the one hand, um, and also what you see in terms of the rise of the far right and populist movements, a lot of anti-Semitism that was probably not more in the open um, as it was um, previously now has been given a kind of a free reign, both because of social media that allows that type of speech which wasn't there beforehand, um, and also the rise of far right movements and also street protests. We've, we've asked lots of questions about the link between anti-Semitism and the type of yellow vest, the gilet jaune protest that had been happening in France for a while. And we've, we've had anti-Semitic incidents within those movements. Um, so, so it's not that it's gone away, it's just that there are certain factors, political factors and te technological developments that have allowed anti-Semitism to kind of rear its ugly head once again. And, Michal, do you think, do you also agree that social, uh, me, you know, social media, the internet, all of that has played a role into spreading also maybe some vicious rumours uh, about uh, the role of Jews in anything that's happening in Europe uh, at the moment? And not only the Jews, but we're talking about anti-Semitism in this programme. Yeah, I think that this is a general change and general shift that happened because of uh, the use of uh, uh, social media as the primary source of information for people and uh, the emotionality of, of, of this language and the emotionality of hate speech, which is on the internet, it affected attitudes that people have in Europe toward different groups, but also 
uh, toward Jews. And uh, this is also true about beliefs in Jewish conspiracy that are very much spread. And when you hear the statements by a person who killed Jews in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, you can see exactly the same arguments that you can hear from politicians in Eastern Europe, in Hungary or in Poland, blaming Jews for immigration, blaming Jews for uh, liberal values. Well, you see, I, I, you raised an important point earlier. I think it's very uh, important, what I say again, is to define exactly what is anti-Semitism. Yeah, and I think in, in this sense, the, the, the International Holocaust Member Alliance said it uh, very clear. But I think to, to also to your previous point, I think there is because of, you know, the social media on one hand is a wonderful platform that allows people to express themselves. On the other hand, it also creates some sort of legitimacy to the vilest of ideas, uh, including the way that we treat the other. And in some cases, the other are Jews and other, you know, other minorities or, or, or migrants. But I think we need to concentrate on the, def the definition of what is anti-Semitism, you know, the hatred to the Jews, which is, which is not new, but in its modern uh, manifestation, it has to do also to do with, with having a, a Jewish state, which is in the, in the heart of, of controversies uh, quite often, but also how it manifests, it manifests itself in, in Europe, bear in mind, on, on the eve of the Second World War, there were 9.4 million Jews in, in the continent. Now there are around 1.3 million. And you know, and gradually we'll see it in public opinion polls that more and more people don't even know that the Holocaust existed, let alone they have detailed understanding of it. And I think it means that we need more education, sometimes legislation, dialogues, in order to eradicate it. But do you think that a this proposed new law uh, that would make, basically make uh, ban uh, any criticism of uh, anti-Zionism anti speech. Do you think that it should go under the umbrella of anti-Semitism? I'm, I'm always worried when we try to legislate values uh, and we start putting people on trial. I, I, I'm a believer in education and dialogue and try to actually appeal to the understanding of people, to hearts and, and winning hearts and, and minds. But I think in certain cases, when it crosses certain lines, uh, sadly, we'll need, uh, we'll need also legislation. Of course, any such legislation should not prevent people from having legitimate criticism of, of any country, any leadership in the world. Because, uh, Hugo, I'm asking this question also because the Israeli government has always been quite uh, sensitive to any kind of criticism. Um, and we had some Israeli leaders who immediately countered that criticism by saying this is anti-Semitism. By having such a law, you're basically banning any kind of criticism of a government, right? That's exactly the danger. It's not entirely clear um, in the way that's going to be legislated in France. But I agree with the, the sentiments that were just expressed beforehand. Clearly, there needs to be a distinction between criticizing the existence of the State of Israel and criticizing the actions of the State of Israel. And of course, certain Israeli leaders kind of hide behind um, the idea that, well, you're criticizing is Israel because you're criticizing our policies. But that's obviously, they're two separate things. And it's, it's a very difficult, obviously, line to hold, but it's one line that I think that needs to be held. And this is one of the questions that will be asked for Macron's law. I think, the, and inversely, what's interesting with that is that if you say that criticizing the actions of the Israeli state is anti-Semitic, in many ways, you're actually giving credence and legitimacy to the type of anti-Semitism that is expressed by in the far left and the far right, which is a lot of it is criticizing Israel, of course. Um, and so if you put the two new together, you're saying, actually, you're right. If you criticize Israel, then you're anti-Semitic. And, and that's part of the problem. We need to keep to be able to keep those two um, aspects distinct. Because, of course, there's lots of people who want to criticize the actions of the state of Israel, including lots of Jews, including lots of Jews in Europe, in Israel itself, and in America, too. Um, but there's a difference between criticizing the actions of the state of Israel and criticizing Israel itself. And the way that those laws that Macron is going to try to put through, it's going to be, have to be quite clear that there's a separation between that, which is why, as your previous um, 
and, uh, speaker was saying, the question of definition is very, very key here. And, and Michal, how do you see that? I mean, it is a very blurry uh, line, really, at this particular uh, moment. How are we, you know, at a certain point, also Europeans can start being a bit scared. Oh, my God, if I open my mouth or I criticize uh, uh, Israel's prime minister, I might be uh, uh, accused of being anti-Semitic because at a certain point you can use these blanket definitions over everything. So how do you think that should be uh, finessed, if I, if I can say, use that word? Uh, I actually support uh, uh, some legislations that are intended to ban uh, uh, hate speech or, or, or uh, uh, public expression of hatred. And in several cases, it really works. Uh, now, when it comes to anti-Semitism, th th there has been some failed attempt. For example, the Polish government tried to ban criticism of Poland recently, the, 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 the famous Holocaust law, which led to, to, a, to a pressure to suppress uh, some forms of, of open expression of, let's say, criticism about the behavior of Poles during the past towards Jews. Uh, and so, so, you know, th there are some nuances here, of course. But uh, what I really think is really crucial is the role of the leaders and the role of political leaders. After the attack on uh, French philosopher Alain Finkielkraut, um, uh, Emmanuel Macron expressed very openly that there is no place for anti-Semitism in France. Now, I did not, not hear such strong statements from the leaders of uh, East European uh, countries, from Viktor Orban or from uh, from um, uh, uh, Jarosław Kaczyński or, or Andrzej Duda in Poland. And uh, we really often, uh, I mean, Jewish people in Poland often uh, face very uh, uh, strong anti-Semitic tendencies that are not confronted by the leaders. And psychologically, we know that the statements of the leaders create the norm, and the norm is very essential for changing people's behavior. Uh, you see, I guess there's also a very confusing image here, uh, because on one hand, the Israeli government, as we said earlier, could be very intolerant toward any kinds of criticism. But then on the other hand, we see uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu cozying with uh, people like Viktor or Orban from Hungary. And, it, and he comes from the far right. And it's very confusing as an image. Well, if it's any help, you're not the only one confused by this kind of behavior. I'm confused too. But, you know, that's a problem, and it goes back to what the, the previous speaker was saying uh, about the role of, of, of leaders and a bit consistency and coherent attitude. Why are you causing up to someone that has such an extreme views against the other, against migrants, against Jews? And, and, you know, there is nothing I can say in favor of what Netanyahu is doing. I think it's sheer opportunism. He thinks he can, he can have both policies at the same time. Which, which I think in the long term, even in the short term, is wrong. But I think a lot of it is to actually use common sense. And common sense, most people understand when the criticism, if you criticize the, the blockade on Gaza or the occupation or uh, arrest, random arrest in the middle of the night of people, keeping them without trial, this has nothing to do with, uh, with anti-Semitism. This is had to do with, with the role of the occupation, the behavior of the state of Israel. On the other hand, if you say, on the other hand, that the state of Israel has no right to exist as a Jewish state, this is a completely different thing. And this is when, when the line is called, and most people understand. But it's also for leader, really, to set the line and not to use it for, as you, I think, imply, to use for opportunistic uh, reasons. Yeah, but you see now. Uh, I mean, you, I completely agree with your distinction between the two, uh, the two, the two uh, scenarios. And but as you said, if now anyone is going to criticize an incursion into Gaza or uh, you know uh, the the random raids in the occupied West Bank, they could be immediately slapped with this anti-Zionism bill, and they could be immediately told that they are illegal because they're to you know they. they they went against the law by, by criticizing that. Well, this means that the law is badly phrased, badly devised. The law has to be devised in a way that will make a clear dis distinction between, between the two. What is criticism, legitimate criticism of, of, of Israel? As one of the previous speakers was saying, this actually play into the, 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 the hands of the far right. If Israel is above criticism and the Jewish state is not displaced into actually Kasa, 
anti-Semitism, but this is control of other countries and the media. This is not the point. The law has to be very clear where the line is drawn between, between the two. And then if it's not, maybe it's better not to have a law. Okay, and Hugo, why now? What really pushed President Macron to come up with this at this particular time? Well, as I said, actually, it's not the first time he's mentioned this. He did mention this a couple of years ago um, when he was commemorating um, the, 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 the Velle d'Ive, which was, as I said, when the Jews were, were parked, the French Jews were parked in a, a sports gymnasium in the north of Paris before um, being sent over, uh, sent to the concentration camp. So it's something that's been there before. And remember, this is not the first time we've had anti-Semitic um, kind of attacks and problems in France too. A couple of years ago now, also there was, it was last year, excuse me, was, um, there was an elderly lady that seemed to have been killed um, because of an anti-Semitic um, attack. So it's not new. And already back then he had said that maybe the law had to be changed. So, um, so it's there, obviously, because of the Gilets jaunes, it's taken on a specific kind of uh, amplitude that perhaps it didn't have before. I think there's two things to add to it, uh, is that one is part of the law, um, th there is a question of anti-Zionism, but he's also, um, there's an element uh, against hate speech and the role that social medias play on that, and I, th I think is important um, and interesting. Um, but I would add, I think the political statement to say anti-Zionism is a new form of anti-Semitism, although I completely agree with what's been discussed in terms of we need to make sure that we're defining the right terms here, that criticizing some of the actions of the State of Israel is not the same as anti-Semitism. But at the same time, it's true that a lot of anti-Semitism today hides behind a critique of, a criticism of the State of Israel. So politically, I think Macron is right to say that, that's true. However, legally, it needs to be quite clear the separation there is between criticizing the State of Israel and um, actually anti-Semitism, which might not be exactly the same thing. Well, Michal, you're in a place where there's actually a kind of a political row brewing between uh, Poland and Israel. But could you see, if this bill really passes in France, could you see that being repeated in other European countries? Yeah, I, I could imagine that th this form of legislation could could be transferred in other countries. And since many years, American Jewish committee is, is, is fighting for the implementation of the uh, of the working definition of, of anti-Semitism, for example, that there will be a shared agreement between countries about what is anti-Semitism and what is not. And also in case of criticism of Israel, I, I can understand that. And this is what we also distinguish in our research, that uh, the criticism that goes uh, as far as to delegitimize the existence of Israel, so to say that Israel has no right to exist, or direct uh, uh, direct references to the Holocaust, or di direct, um, let's say, uh, comparisons between what happens today in Israel and between the, the, the Third Reich, uh, this is actually uh, uh, going beyond what can be accepted. Yes, so this is already anti-Semitic, and I think that there could be a, a shared agreement, not only in European, but maybe even in the, in the Muslim states uh, outside of Europe, uh, because I, I believe that there is, uh, after uh, uh, hearing to, to other speakers at this panel, uh, that there might be some, some shared understanding of when the, uh, when the criticism of Israel transgresses the borders of, of, of becoming anti-Semitic. Well, certainly the figures show that anti-Semitism is on the rise, as much as xenophobia, uh, I would say, around uh, many countries. But we have reached the end of this program. So thanks to our guests, Yossi Meckelberg, Michal Bilevich, and Hugo Drochon. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hud Abdelhamid, and the whole team here, bye for now.